Hello, I am Dr. Ahmed Abdelal, and today we start Unit 3 uh, in uh, Speech and Hearing Science. And here we focus on articulation and resonance of the vocal tract. So we are going to learn about, first, a review of the anatomy and the physiology, just a very basic, very quick review because this is not supposed to be a rehash of anatomy and physiology. It is, we just need to refresh your um, knowledge by a start. I mean, with a start, speaking about the anatomy and the you know, physiology in just one, um, one lecture. So then, the next part, we are going to speak about resonance of the vocal tract. And we spoke about this in the previous um, couple of units, but here we spend more time. And then we speak about each individual sound, speech articulation, and how you know each sound is described, how it is um, produced in terms of the manner of production, the placement and voicing, or you know, voicing for consonants, and then vowels. So, again, this is not supposed to be a rehash of phonetics, but you need to, to have a phonetic background um, in order to uh, kind of uh, do very well. I'll try to do my best in case someone hasn't, but um, I'll, I'll use, I'm not going to use too much, um, you know, of the uh, phonetic symbols, I'm going to try to give you words and examples anyways when it comes to that. Then we're going to speak about, in the last part, we're going to speak about the formats uh, in the vocal tract and we take groups of um, groups of sounds, uh, consonants, and we describe how they are, the formats are in the vowels and so on. So that is what speech articulation and resonance um, are about. So let's begin. We learned before that resonance, when you speak about objects, we speak first about objects and things that you can touch, you can feel, um, and resonators and tubes to make the idea for you closer, to make you find something that is concrete. But now, when we speak about the vocal tract resonance, <clears throat> it is more complicated than a tube or a cylinder or, you know, anything that you can think about. Um, so, we said before that the vocal tract acts like a closed, like a tube that is closed on one end. And we said that kind of any tube that's closed in one end, when you put a, a tone into it, any sound, I'm not speaking about a speech sound or anything, in that case, any sound, that sound is going to be only the first time. One quarter of the wave will fit in along the, long, the length of the tube. So the vocal tract is the same. The vocal tract begins right above the vocal folds, above the larynx, and it continues through the oral cavity. And that is, again, uh, about 16, if you say male and female together, about 16 centimeters. So, we also learned before that a quarter wave resonator is selective. It doesn't just um, play anything that goes um, into it. it it first selects things that are within its own resonant frequency, natural resonant frequency. So you can make sounds and change, keep changing pitch and change when it reaches, when that pitch reaches the vocal resonance of the vocal tract, it's the vocal tract will amplify that sound. And then from that point on, it will skip, it will take say the first for, um, formant or harmonic is going to be uh, amplified. Then the second one will be, del will be attenuated, will be weakened. The third one will stay. And so it will skip, you know, it will selectively take the odd 
frequencies from one, three, five, and so on. And we call these formats. The vocal tract produces up to 40 formats. However, the most important ones of them are the first three. And to get more information about sounds that we are studying, uh, we commonly study the fourth format as well, especially for vowels. So resonance in the vocal tract is defined as, uh, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, uh, this is not a definition, but resonance results from the filtering out, the deletion of these even numbers, the filtering out of the sound source. The sound source is the vocal fold buzz. The vocal folds make a fundamental frequency like the guitar string. You, you pluck the guitar string and then the sound is gonna go into the box of the guitar and the air inside of the box is going to resonate, will vibrate in response to your fundamental frequency. Remember the, the source filter theory? The source is the vocal fold buzz the uh, filter is the vocal tract as it selectively weeds out uh, forces that oppose the wave and it amplifies the <coughs> uh, particular frequencies that come within range of different parts of it. So it is the result of filtering the sound source passing through the supraglottic cavities of the vocal tract. The supraglottic cavity, remember the vocal folds are like this. The opening between them is called the glottis. The space beneath them is called the subglottic space. The space above is called the supraglottic space. So here we go from the supraglottic space because the sound is going to, I mean, the air is going to come out. The vocal folds will be vibrating <coughs> here and then the sound will get into the supraglottic cavity and it will keep going out to either the nose or the mouth. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so as it goes, that buzz, that raw material for the sound, it gets filtered out, it gets amplified, it gets refined so that it gets out of, of the lips strong enough to cause the air vibration, then that will go to your ears and you can hear what you are saying. So, the, um, from back to, to the first unit, speaking about sounds, sound and physics, sound physics and the, how sound you know, travels and so on, we studied the relationship between volume and frequency. So, now I'm going to ask the question, I'm not going to, you know, say it, now you should know it, but I mean, we have spent so much time on it. You complete this. The larger the volume is, the blank the frequency. And the, the, the smaller the volume is, the blank the frequency. Now, if you do not know this, there will be a problem because we have spent quite a lot of time discussing that. If you do not know it, then go back and study the material in chapter one. Chapter one is the chapter that discusses sound in general terms and concepts and so on, but we take that and keep it and we keep going back to it. Frequent going, do we apply the rest of the course is the, an application um, that relates to chapter one. So you better, you know, go back if there's a concept that you, you forgot or something, go back and refresh your memory. So now, volume, the relationship between volume and frequency is well established, it is systematic. So the larger the volume is, the lower the frequency. That means if you have, have a larger container, and say a large room, like the room that I'm in now, my voice uh, is really resounding and, um, and uh, is lower pitch because the room is big, it has a vaulted ceiling and my voice is quite, quite resounding in the room. So if I were 
to bring more furniture into the room or if i bring say in this room i bring um say fill half of it with sand it will be smaller my voice is not gonna be like that my voice will be higher pitch so how does this apply to the oral cavity the oral cavity is a space filled by the tongue basically so but the tongue can move forward can move backwards and the tongue can go up can go down the tongue can um can can be uh, elevated to the back like when you say o or elevated up front when you say e so the tongue is is going everywhere up down you know front back and making a lot of adjustments as we speak so that means it is a major modifier of the vocal tract and we'll discuss this uh, and we'll discuss five modifiers of the vocal tract so the vocal tract again when the um, resonances that the vocal tract amplifies okay the resonances that the vocal tract amplifies the form are called formats the formats are basically dark bands lines on the spectrogram when you have a spectrogram you have these dark lines that will will be very familiar with and the lowest one is first format the second so these are basically formats and they mark they are used in the analysis of voice uh, voice analysis this, this is where the term came from so the resonant frequencies in the vocal tract we mentioned before that if you want to look for uh, f1 it is in the inferior and in the uh, hypopharynx f1 and you don't worry about this area but it's, it's this area here. and f2 you look between the alveolar ridge and the tongue tip this space f3 is between the velum and the tongue when you say ko and go this is where so and this as the sound comes here and hits here when it matches the the the, the resonance of this area this area will amplify for f2 when the, the sound wave matches the this area that this will uh, will be uh, uh, repeating the sound and 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 then the same for f so because of that if you bring the tongue forward for example the back of the pharynx is going to be bigger so what do you do you have you go back and say oh the larger the volume the lower the frequency and and then now if the tongue leaves this area it's gonna have to go move physically out it can't exist in two places at once so it's gonna move forward and up so up here at the near the alveolar ridge that means you have now made the space smaller so what kind of frequency are you gonna are you gonna have for f2 for e for example and then you look here at, at this area what kind of frequency will you have depending on the position of the tongue so the tongue where it moves it's going to make a big change in f1 f2 f3 so every sound is described in this especially vowels they are described particularly with by these formats f1 2 3 are the most important ones but f4 is also studied as well because it, it it gives important information so what are the five modifiers of the vocal tract what are these structures that can make the vocal tract smaller or bigger longer or shorter because remember we said that you know length is a factor when we speak about resonance we have length the longer the resonator the longer the tube is the lower the frequency the shorter the tube is the higher the frequency the wider the tube is the uh, um, uh, lower the frequency the, the the narrower a tube is and, and it goes on it's a matter of space so 
First is the tongue. As I explained, if the tongue moves forward, F1 is going to be lower. And then the area that the tongue fills or comes, you know, constricts, makes it smaller, then it will be higher pitch and so on. That is just a simple thing that you need to, to understand. What is the second one? The jaw, the mandible. Let's call it with its anatomic name, the mandible. The mandible constantly goes down and goes up. So when it goes down, how big will the oral cavity be? Of course, it will be bigger. So what kind of frequency will you have? We say, ah, oh, ah. Oh. So when you say, ah, oh, the, the muscle that is called the hyoglossus, where the hyoid bone is some uh, here. The hyoglossus, the out of the hyoid bone, the muscle emerges and it goes up and inserts into the lateral margin, lateral inferior margins of the tongue. So when you say ah, oh, uh, in order to say ah, oh, that muscle is going to contract. It will pull down and back the tongue, down and back at once. It, as you saw before in the previous section. So as a result um, of this, the tongue is going to be pulled down and back. How will F1 be? How will F2 be? How will F3 be? Now we notice in addition to that, where the tongue is out of the way in the front, and in addition to that, we say, ah, oh, the jaw is open wide and it makes f2 even even lower and f3 as well so how many modifiers did we discuss the tongue the mandible the next one is the pharynx the pharynx the pharynx is <clears throat> made up of a group of muscles called the pharyngeal constrictors the pharynx is a wall It is a, a space, I mean, sorry, a space that is made or, you know, surrounded by walls of muscle. So it has the posterior pharyngeal wall. When you open your mouth, you will see part of the posterior pharyngeal wall. You have the lateral walls, lateral walls. And then the front. There are other structures. There are no walls. In, in the front, you have the tongue, the velum, the um, larynx, and so on. So that is how the... So these walls are made out of muscle. And these muscles, by nature, they constrict and they dilate or relax. So when they constrict, they are going to narrow the vocal tract, and that will affect the frequency. When they dilate, that's going to give more, create more room. That will make the frequency lower. And this is where, when someone is nervous, all these muscles, the vocal folds themselves become elongated and the person, you know, become tense and, and, and the intrinsic muscles themselves become tense. They elongate the vocal folds themselves. But in addition to that, these constrictor muscles in the um, that uh, surround the pharynx, they constrict. They are going to make the pharynx um, uh, uh, small, smaller in diameter. In addition, a lot of other muscles will happen that are going to, for example, elevate the, the larynx. So a lot of action will happen to make the space smaller in the, in the vocal tract, in addition to making the pitch of the vocal folds themselves higher and that is going to make the person speak in a high pitch that's when they are nervous the muscles contract and uh, uh, involuntarily of course so pharynx pharynx uh, or pharyngeal muscles are modifiers of the vocal tract you need to explain say which are the modifiers number one say for example pharynx you say how how does it 
affect or or modify the vocal tract. You just do it like I am explaining it now. How does the tongue modify the vocal tract? You say basically the the tongue is a mobile structure. The tongue, if the tongue moves back towards the pharynx, it is going to make a constriction. It will limit the space. It will make the space smaller in the hypopharynx or the laryngopharynx. This blue space will be smaller. So as a result, the F1 is going to to be higher. And now at the very same time, F2, which is localized in here, then you say that will be lower. And then, you know, you speak about, for example, another sound. What about when you say, ooh, the tongue is going to be lifted way back and up, and that is going to um, make the distance, physical distance between the hypopharynx and the lips is going to make it longer because you have to climb the mountain that the tongue makes. Go up above it and then keep going, going. But in addition to that, the lips themselves will protrude and that will elongate the vocal tract to the longest level that it has. So, um, you need again to, to understand which are the modifiers and how each one exactly modifies or changes the frequencies F1, 2, 3. So the, the fourth one is the velum or the soft palate. One of the reasons we, we have the two names, you know, velum, um, for example, is if you have a, the velum is engaged in making sounds like kahanga. So how do you describe? Do you say the the villa makes uh, soft palate or sounds? That just becomes awkward. So we get back the the same term from Latin. Soft palate means velum, and we say velar sound, velar muscles, velar structures, and so on. So the villum, when we are breathing, it has to be down. Okay, when we are breathing, the velum has to be down like this. And the space between the velum and the posterior pharyngeal wall, this is the posterior pharyngeal wall here. That space, and I'm seeing if I can write, I can't. That space is called, pay attention to this, this is an extremely important space. It's called the velopharyngeal port, the velopharyngeal port, this space here between the back of the velum and the, the um, posterior pharyngeal wall. Okay, the velopharyngeal port, it includes a piece of the oropharynx and the piece of the nasopharynx. So, the when you say Mm, mm, mm. the velum is the same way as you are breathing. So this is, this is the only three sounds when the velum is down. Otherwise, when you say any other sound of the 43 English sounds, the velum is going to be lifting, be lifted up, and it will make contact with this structure here that's coming down like this. This structure is the adenoid pad, or otherwise some people call that the adenoids. So that is the adenoid pad. The velum rises and makes contact with that, and that separates the oral cavity from the nasal cavity. But, but by doing that, will it make the oral cavity bigger or smaller? Will it make the, the, the um, the pharyngeal space greater or smaller. Of course, it will make both of them bigger. So it will be lifting up out of the way and it will make a contact with the nasal cavity. It will create a seal and all of this space then will be added to the space in the vocal tract uh, that leads to the, from vocal folds to, um, to the lips. So that is, again, tongue mandible, 
pharynx, uh, velum, and then we have um, one, uh, the, the fifth one. The fifth modifier of the vocal tract are the lips. Lips. For example, if you want to make the vocal tract at, put it at its shortest limit, you say E, you retract, take the lips out of the way, and you, narrow, you, you make your vocal tract about a half centimeter shorter. Now, if you go from E to O, E, O, you are going to create a space that is almost, almost an inch, or maybe three quarters of an inch for the distance between E and O. So the lips are a major modifier. For example, and again, how do they modify? Just like I explained, if you want to make the vocal tract shorter, you retract, say, sound like E. If you make it bigger, long, I mean, uh, longer, you say, sound like O. And why is that, that important? Because we have a rule that says the longer the vocal tract is, or the longer any tube is, the lower its frequency. As a matter of fact, there's a kind of monkeys that want, you know, it, 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 in order for it to seem more threatening and bigger and um, to scare other predators, it, it puffs its cheeks and extends its lips very far and it makes that sound that just is so low frequency and it makes it look bigger, much bigger than its real size. Okay, so now we are going to look at these structures. Uh, we are going to look at the anatomy and physiology of the pharynx quickly. And uh, again, this is not meant to be a detail, but you have the, the, the textbook and that speaks about it in detail. And um, in the, uh, you have the quiz uh, that will address that as well. So the pharynx is a vertical tube that goes from the right about above the level of the vocal folds and it extends it goes up to the, poster, uh, the, the posterior part of the nasal cavities the posterior so that this vertical space that is the pharynx and we said the vocal tract consists of the pharynx the oral cavity, the nasal cavity. So the pharynx is divided into three areas. First one, that blue area is called the hypopharynx, or because it's next to the larynx, we call it the laryngopharynx. Laryngopharynx. The yellow area, that's you can see it when you open your mouth and say, ah, look in the mirror. What you see here is the oropharynx because it's across from the oral cavity. And then the area that's across from the velum and, and, and the past, uh, across from the, the, the nose, or in other words, in the, the posterior segment of the nasal cavity, we know it as the nasopharynx. So this is the pharynx, and the, these are the three uh, segments of it. So the pharynx, as I mentioned, is a space, vertical space, that is surrounded, or that space is surrounded by um, sheets of muscle. It has the um, posterior pharyngeal wall and the lateral pharyngeal wall. These muscles are called, will begin first with the, uh, the uh, pharyngeal constrictors. So these are three sheets of muscle. They start, I mean, they, they, they go like back, and the same muscles, they bend around to make the lateral walls. So here, there is a line of here symmetry. If you make a sagittal cut and go down, down, down what is on the left is the same as what's on the right so 
there's a little tip here going called the pharyngeal ray phi. That's the, it's kind of a point that divides the one side from the other, pharyngeal ray phi. But, but the, the superior pharyngeal constrictor muscles uh, are inserted onto that and, and they kind of bend around. So they go, half of them will be making half of the posterior pharyngeal wall is made from muscles of one side and the other half of the posterior pharyngeal wall is made of the other muscles. So they, they unite here in the middle and each one curves to the side to make the one pharyngeal wall. So we have these muscles here uh, is the superior pharyngeal constrictor and then then below it and, and uh, overlapping on it like this that is the medial or the middle pharyngeal constrictor and on or overlapping over the medial pharyngeal constrictor so here's the medial pharyngeal constrictor it goes like this and fans down as well and then uh, posterior to it uh, is the inferior pharyngeal constrictor so one second so, So, we're going to go now and look more at these. Uh, sorry. The, the superior pharyngeal constrictor, it, the main function of it is to pull the pharyngeal walls forward in order to help uh, to, to narrow the pharynx for purposes of swallowing. And also, as it, it pulls the, the pharyngeal wall, the posterior pharyngeal wall forward, it has a, an area that is protruding. Um, on, on that area, there, the, the, what they call it, the, the adenoids are on that area. So when the posterior pharyngeal wall protrudes out, uh, uh, forward, it will come closer to the velum. It will make it easy for the velum. So the, ve the, the posterior pharyngeal is like this. The velum is like this, up and down. It, and it needs to make the, the seal, across, you know, uh, okay, um, on the, with the uh, adenoids. So if the posterior pharyngeal wall wouldn't go forward and come to meet the pharynx, I mean, to, to meet the soft palate halfway, then the person might have hyponasality, I mean, hyponasality, the air might get out of their nose and they will have, an, they will have a nasal voice. So, so, like that. So, the, the upper segment that is made by the superior pharyngeal constrictor again it it bulges forward in order to narrow the pharynx when you swallow at the same time also it 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 comes forward when the velum rises so that they can make a seal so that you can say all your 40 oral sounds the middle pharyngeal constrictor which is here See, this is the hyoid bone, one kind of the uh, posterior part of it, and uh, this is uh, arising from it. And of course, again, it fans down, down this way also. Well, you could see it here. Um, so this is the superior, this is the middle. So the middle constrictor, pharyngeal constrictor arises from the horns of the hyoid 
and inserts onto the median pharyngeal ray phi. So we said the median pharyngeal ray phi is this little tiny, tiny segment here of bone here. Okay, so this muscle just rises and inserts into the median pharyngeal ray. The median pharyngeal ray is the, the midline that basically defines the point where the one half of the pharynx connects with the half. <coughs> So what it does is that it narrows, narrows the diameter of the pharynx. So that again, if, if someone is nervous and that kind of narrows it, it, it contributes to making you uh, uh, ha have a higher pitch. The inferior pharyngeal constrictor now includes two segments, two segments. One of them is very, very important. So here is, so this whole area here is from here to here is the inferior pharyngeal constrictor so it includes an upper segment and then includes a segment an inferior segment that is like a like a, a shell see on the right side like a seashell so what this uh, muscle the crico originates on the sides of the cricoid Remember the cricoid, which is the base of the larynx. So the, it originates there, and each one fans, in, um, fans uh, posteriorly, and then bends around, and they unite just like this. So what they make now, they make the cricopharyngus muscle, which is here. And the cricopharyngus muscle now, see, this is the esophagus. This is the larynx. You are looking this way. And the cricopharyngus surrounds the upper segment of the pharynx. I mean, the, um, uh, the upper segment of the esophagus. It makes the upper segment of the esophagus. It is called the superior esophageal sphincter sphincter because it has it, you can control it so when the food that you swallow comes and passes through this area here this muscle both sides of course contract and squeeze squeeze above the bolus of whatever you are eating or swallowing they squeeze above it and it forces it into your esophagus because your esophagus is not an open tube like this. You just put food and just goes boom, boom, it doesn't go like that. It's like a deflated fire hose, just like this. And then you put something in it that one segment opens up and then the top closes and then the bolus keeps going down and the, the, the esophagus closes on top of it and it keeps going down this way so that the closure is going to force the fluid or the food into your stomach. Even when, even if you have something in your swelling and you, you, you stand on your head, the, that is gonna, the food is going to go up into to the stomach. That's called peristalsis. Peristalsis. So you need to know this very, very important muscle. It is very important because we as speech language pathologists, we are also specialists in swallowing, feeding and swallowing. And this muscle is very, very important in swallowing and feeding. The cricopharyngus is part of the inferior pharyngeal constrictor. Okay, so the um it arises from the the cricopharyngus arises from the cord and the thyroid cartilages and it reduces the diameter of the lower pharynx and that lower part of that lower pharynx serves also as the uh, upper esophageal sphincter <clears throat> okay now we speak about the other pharyngeal muscles and one of them is the pharyngeal, the uh, stylopharyngus. We came across this before. So here is the styloid process, this little piece of bone here, the styloid process. 
and out of this styloid process we three muscles originate and all of them begin with stylo 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 so we have the styloglossus originates from the styloid process and inserts onto the lateral inferior margins of the tongue so when you say oh the the styloglossus is going to pull the tongue back and up to give you that to make the tongue hump and go back the we'll look at it again later so you need to know it now so now this is the hyoid bone the origin of insertion is the styloid process and the insertion is hyoid so stylohyoid and that muscle is um, it elevates the larynx and we studied that before then the stylopharyngus that originates on the styloid process and then it courses down to insert onto the in, you know uh, uh, pharyngeal constrictors and at the same time especially the middle pharyngeal constrictor and some of the fibers insert onto the um, uh, the uh, what do you call them the back portion I'm trying to find the term the um, posterior uh, the posterior margins of the thyroid cartilage so here is the thyroid cartilage so the posterior the thyroid comes is open uh, solidly closed in the front but then curves around and it is not open in the back so the margins here this is where the uh, some of the fibers of the stylopharyngus insert so the function of this is to elevate and to open the pharynx for swallowing so imagine when when you go to swallow this is originates all of these muscles because they originate on the um, styloid process they pull up toward their origin <coughs> so the stylopharyngus elevates to open the pharynx for swallowing and it is innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve which is nerve number 12 cranial nerve 12. so the boundaries of the oral cavity now we now we are gonna move from the we are taking the vocal tract segment by segment studying its you know anatomy and physiology and and connecting it with the science of speech. So we discussed the pharynx, and now we'll move to the oral cavity, then we'll move to the nasal cavity. So the oral cavity is uh, bounded anteriorly by the lips and posteriorly by the, uh, by the uh, fascial uh, pillars. These two arches that you see, I'm gonna show them to you later. Um, so it has many and also on the sides it's bounded by the cheeks and um, uh, superiorly it's bounded by the hard palate and the soft palate and inferiorly it is bounded by the tongue and the uh, the floor of the mouth so the oral cavity has many major landmarks that absolute that are absolutely important uh, for speech these include the teeth and by the way uh, when we speak about vowels because vowels all of them are periodic sounds they involve vocal fold vibration and they do not involve much constriction along the vocal tract the vocal tract is wide open and the sounds continue as you say so we do not say where what part of the vocal tract produces vowels we do not we don't say is a vowel voiced or voiceless because all of them are voiced all of them are periodic so then we all of this that we are going to say is about consonant sounds okay consonant sounds are uh, described with reference to three things is the sound voiced or voiceless is the sound uh, where is the sound uh, made like at the lips uh, but with the uh, uh, 
connect, for example, having the tongue come in contact with the, a certain part. So placement and also manner. What is the, how does that sound sound like? So we have the teeth, they are involved in making sounds, especially, particularly the maxillary incisors. An incisor is a cutter. So the four teeth in the front are called the maxillary incisors because they insert into the maxilla, the maxillary bone. So the teeth, what sounds can you make that involve the teeth? So we have four sounds, four different sounds. Um, two of these sounds you make by contact between your lower lip and the maxillary incisors. So these are the, the uh, two of the of the four. These are and you notice the difference is voicing. It's complete aperiodic sound noise, and is a combination of vo vo voicing. Uh, I mean, vocal fold vibration and and noise from the vocal tract. That is a, um, a combination of periodic and aperiodic. So we call this voiced consonant. Then we have two other sounds that involve the tongue and the teeth. So when you put your tongue between your teeth, you say as in thumb or beth. Okay, that is voiceless. And with the same exact location, with the same position, the tongue between the teeth, we call that is a voiced form. So in phonetics, we have two different symbols for, for this uh, letter, for these two letters to make the, so to, one is, um, is the theta and one is an, you know, different sound. So it's a symbol. So these are two sounds, including the and the, two and two. And then they have the alveolar ridge. The alveolar ridge is behind the central maxillary incisors. Central is these two broad teeth in the front. Behind them, there's a little protruding point called a ridge. We call it the alveolar ridge. So, see, all your teeth, all your teeth are inserted onto this, you know, kind of horseshoe structure that we call the alveolar process alveolar process that comes from a bone called the maxilla. You have studied this. I mean, you had anatomy. So the, all the maxillary teeth uh, are connected onto them, the alveolar uh, process. Now on the alveolar process in this area here is the only area that kind of makes like a little bump. And we call this the alveolar ridge. So how many sounds do we make when um, we bring the tongue in contact with the alveolar ridge? So we have s and z. We have l and r. No, no. R. We, we have um, n as in knife and d and t, six alveolar sounds. That is because we describe them this way. These are called, the th is called an interdental sound, interdental or lingua dental, two names, lingua dental or interdental, th and th. The f and v, both of them are described as labial dental. Please do not say labial dental, please do not. Whenever you combine a word that has an L at the end with another word after it, you take the L out and put the O, like oral and motors, the oral motor, laryng laryngeal, and then pharynx, laryngopharynx. Okay, so this is just make sure to say lingua dental or, um, or, uh, interdental. Uh, f 
is labio dental and the v is also labio dental so you need to understand these sounds i'm going to ask you to give me examples of sounds produced by contact between um, contact between uh, partic the tongue and particular structures or uh, you know as we describe them here just like we describe them here so make sure you are able to give me examples of sounds or name all the sounds that are produced by for example contact between the tongue and uh, between the tongue and the uh, teeth between the lips and the lower lip and the teeth between the tongue tip and the alveolar ridge so the, this is all explained here the hard palate is <coughs> excuse me the bony structure that separates the oral cavity from nasal cavity and be uh, attached to this um, bony structure is the soft structure which is called the soft palate so this is the hard palate the soft palate is attached to it and both of them make the roof of the mouth and the floor of the nasal cavities so the hard palate is involved in making sounds like this er we describe the er as a palatal sound er shh is a palatal sound and um and, and I'm, it takes a long time to to write symbols um i don't have that on my keyboard but uh, some of you might not be familiar with the phonetics um, so this is zh, zh, as measure measure um, then we also have the j, j as in judge and the ch as in as as in chair or check so all of these sounds are palatal sounds that are made uh, when the tongue contacts a certain area of the hard palate so sounds that are that involve the soft palate are called velar sounds but hard palate we call them palatal and then so the velum is involved in two three sounds in english and this these include the k -k 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 -k, where the velum contacts the back of the dorsum of the tongue and they make a closure and you say g and k so these are called velar or sometimes they're also called lingua velar but it is understood anyways that the tongue is the one that does this and that that so some people say there's no need to say lingua this lingua they just say dental sounds and enter dental or say uh, velar sounds not to make life harder on people so anyways, whatever term that you use is fine for me. I just want you to understand that one thing might be called several names. The other sound that, um, that involves the velum is the mm, mm, the we are just strictly speaking about consonants. Mm as in king, thing. Okay, the velum just comes down more. So here, I just want to show you, this is the, you can see the hard palate here, you can see the soft palate behind it, uh, here also. Uh, you could see here, this person has what seems to be a submucous cleft, because the, the tissue here um, is, is, if you fl put a flashlight, you will see that this tissue is transparent. And the muscles that are superior, that are behind the tissue, are not really closed here. And this, you could see the split here. That is some kind of cleft palate, but it involves the posterior part of the, of the palate, as you could see. And the uvula is split as well. So, um, the, I want to show you on this image the fascial pillars, fascial pillars, these two arches, sometimes called palatal arches as well. And the adenoid, the tonsils are behind, behind the, this, the fascial pillars. 
And this is the posterior pharynx. I mean, part of the posterior pharynx we know as the oropharynx. Okay, these are the maxillary incisors, there's one, two, three, four, and the cent two central ones are called the uh, central incisors. We are going to study them soon. So the structure of the heart palate now um, is, as we progress into the structures of the oral cavity, uh, it is made out, see this uh, area that is like a horseshoe, this area that, that the teeth are implanted into it. This is the alveolar process. And the alveolar ridge will be here, but this is bone, only bone. It doesn't have the skin and so on. So the alveolar ridge will be right behind the maxillary incisors. So there is, the, the, the palate forms as two separate pieces. First, once this, uh, you know, the, um, each side of the maxillary bone grows one shelf, and the shelf goes, grows medially, and then it connects until they meet in the center, as you could see, and they fuse. The incisive foramen, foramen is a, is a hole, and that is for usually blood vessels to go through and so on. Some can, in some cases, this uh, doesn't close well for, for some people. So there is a wedge here, say one, two, and there's a wedge here and here like this. And that area, like a triangle here, is called the pre-maxilla. Pre and as part of the pre-maxilla is the alveolar ridge. So then the shelves, the hard bone shelves that grow out of the maxillary bone, out of, you know, these alve um, alveolar processes. That is called the palatine process of the maxilla, okay? The maxilla is a bone, so that's the palatine process of the maxilla. So here's one, here's another one. Then, as you go posteriorly, See this line here? That is the end of the palatine, palatine processes of the maxilla. Then you have a palatine bone here. That is a palatine bone that is, is sutured with the, palat with the um, uh, palatal processes. And that is your hard palate. Then there are two little protruding segments of bone called the pterygoid plates that come out of uh, the pterygoid bone. And you could see them here like two little, you know, kind of horns. We're going to discuss them later, but a muscle comes from above, comes from above, and comes down and passes under the pterygoid, uh, actually, no, uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, the, 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 this is called the hamulus, this little tip of bone called the hamulus process. And, and the muscle comes under it and emerges on this side and then connects onto the posterior margins of the palatal, palatine bone here. And, and, and then that makes something called the palatal aponeurosis, uh, which is a fibrous uh, structure. It is not bone. It is is something similar to cartilage, if you will. Um, but it's not cartilage either. But it's a, it's a tendon, and it inserts onto the um, posterior margins of the palatine bone, and that is called the aponeurosis. And all the muscles, except for one, all the soft uh, palate muscles insert onto that palatal aponeurosis. So I'm going to explain that later. You need to understand it really well, but I'll show you that in context with pictures. But for now, just know the parts that make up the hard palate. The hard palate, by the way, in development, um, between the sixth and seventh week, the 
it begins to develop this uh, triangle here the premaxilla there's a triangle here there's a like a, a bone a, a, a wedge and here's another one so when they, this begins to to form uh, here it, it, it starts to fuse and then fusion here and then fusion so the fusion begins in the front where the right part of the palatine process meets the left part they fuse like this from the begin from the front and then the fusion uh, as the development continues from the sixth you know uh, sixth week the fusion be continues to go posteriorly just like a zipper where the two sides keep uniting with each other until they make what you see now okay so how the hard palate is formed uh, how it fuses that is the process it begins anteriorly and moves posteriorly like a zipper so this way um if the, the there's a problem and this doesn't doesn't close then the person will have a, um, a cleft palate cleft palate cleave is to, to cut with a cleaver cleft is something that is split okay so now we are going to move on from the hard palate into the soft palate into the velum so the, the person is now looking this way and what you see is the posterior uh, view of the velum and the nasal cavity. So here's inside of the nasal cavity. These are called nasal conchi, like these shelves. There are three of them. And in the nasal cavities are split by, you know, one bone that is shaped like a plow is called the vomer bone okay and this is the bone at the lower part of the bone where it meets with the palatine bone see it meets with this one this bone here so here the the vomer fuses with the palatine bone at this point this is called the posterior posterior nasal spine okay because it's in back of the nasal cavities posterior nasal spine it's an important spot so pay attention to it we'll come back to it at some point but this is what the velum is like from side to side and you need it's like this and you need to lift it up and you need to have it down so when you speak and say any oral sound the velum has to be up like that sealing closing the oral cavity of from the nasal cavity and you could see the tongue here i mean the um, base of the tongue and the um, uh, epiglottis and the larynx laryngeal inlet and then behind the laryngeal inlet is the esophagus here so the velum is made up of <coughs> excuse me the palatal aponeurosis which should be here and attached to it is all the muscles that come together and make up the structure we know as the soft palate or the velum so the palatal aponeurosis serves as the point of attachment for muscle all muscles of the velum except for one and that one is the musculus uvulus i'll discuss it in detail in a few minutes so then uh, we have nerve tissue coming through and then we have blood vessels running through it and it, the whole thing is covered with an epithelial membrane from top and bottom and the velum the i'm sorry the yeah the velum on the side that is facing the oral cavity has some large ta um, taste buds it is not just the tongue that has taste buds the 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 palate itself, the soft palate, uh, and the area that is facing the tongue, it, it has some large taste buds. So that is where 
the, the these are all the structures of the velum. So let's look at the uh, innervation. I am briefly, I'm just going to mention that the, the pal all palatal muscles except one, all palatal muscles are innervated by a complex, it's called, it's called plexus, of branches of two nerves coming together and they give off, you know, kind of a complex and they give off nerves to innervate. Uh, parts of the pharynx and parts of the veal and the velum and these are called the pharyngeal plexus that comes out of the accessory nerve which is number nerve number uh, 11 and the vagus nerve which is nerve number 10 cranial nerve 10 so branches from these two nerves make something called uh, the pharyngeal plexus and it innervates all the muscles of the palate except for the tensor um, villi palatini muscle, which is innervated by the uh, trigeminal nerve. So let's now look at the muscles that make up the velum and how they behave and, and how they connect. So the, these muscles are divided into three categories. First one is the uh, uh, are the muscles of elevation it means you, i said that here's the posterior pharyngeal wall here, uh, here is the velum and it, it moves like knee action like a knee up and down and it has to be down most of the time except when basically when you speak because when you breathe if the velum is up like this you'll not be able to breathe yeah from your nose and the normal way is to breathe through your nose so it is always the velum is always down when you are not speaking and when you are speaking all the sounds are produced with the velum up except the nasal sounds so nasal sounds needs the velopharyngeal port to be opened and so you can the air can go out when you say mm, mm, mm. so the, the the what muscles elevate the velum like this and then the velum now what you know what muscles can bring it down and what and there and then there's another muscle that tenses um tenses um the, the station too well i'll explain so but look for this one this is an elevator muscle or muscle that's of elevation called the levator villi palatini or levator villi palati either one <clears throat> and um, from the levator it reminds you of elevator means to lift up you see the arrows that means the origin is above here and when this muscle contracts it's going to pull up the velum this muscle and we'll discuss them in detail and then you have the musculus uvulus which is here this one uh, remember i said all the muscles of the pharynx are attached to the palatal aponeurosis except for one and that is the musculus uvulus the musculus uvulus originates on the posterior nasal spine as you could see here and it attaches directly to the posterior nasal spine and the palatal aponeurosis goes down under it and it serves as an anchor for it so the part of it can can rest in it. Um, then some fibers go above it as well uh, of the palatal aponeurosis so it's kind of sandwiches it uh, and the, the posterior segment of it so and you can see the palatal arches here so then we have the tensor uh, tensor villi palatini muscle and then the depressor muscles that, that bring down the velum these are the palatoglossus and the palatopharyngus so let's take them <clears throat> one by one the levator villi palatini the one that i mentioned here it makes the the bulk it makes the biggest part of the velum see the fibers come down and and kind of cross to the other side beneath the musculus uvulus 
and above the muscular cerebellus and they kind of connect you know with the other side so you could see that now and it makes about a significant part of the of the velum of the velum and it elevates the velum and it pulls it back so that it can <clears throat> make a closure against the posterior pharyngeal against the adenoid path so the origin it originates on the petreous portion of the temporal bone here is the temporal bone there's a a particular <coughs> area <coughs> excuse me and the temporal bone that is hardened like a rock it's petra means rock petreous petreous means rocky portion and and uh, and in addition on the medial walls of the eustachian tube okay here's the eustachian tube that connects your ear middle ear with your nasal cavities with the posterior um, part of the nasal cavity here so this muscle origin has two origins on the petreous portion of the temporal bone and on the lateral margin of the <clears throat> eustachian tube so the action is to elevate and retract the posterior velum the the, the velum just it's going to lift it up and pull it back towards the, the pharynx to close then the musculus uvulus the one that is here and i mentioned here's the posterior nasal spine this muscle inserts onto it and see um the the muscle in reality has two segments it has a left and right but but it's treated as just an as it's treated as unpaired um the the uvula is attached to to this muscle uvula so it makes the middle portion and the posterior portion of the velum and um, the uvula is is hanging down from it so the origin is on the posterior nasal spine and it inserts into the mucous membrane of the cover of the velum and the whole velum is encased into a mucous membrane or an epithelial membrane so when this muscle so it's like this when it contracts it bunches up itself in the, the upper fibers and it bunches up and it, it just lifts up like this when it contracts so it helps the velum be lifted and that will also be at the same time like the levator belly palate and I, when it, they both work they lift up and one of them pulls back so the one that pulls back is the levator villi palatini, but this one is just goes up like this. So it shortens the villa on bunches up. So you could see here is the musculus uvulus here, and beneath that white tissue here is the tendon that I told you about that comes from the tensor tympani, tensor um, uh, uh, villi palatini and comes down under the uh, hamulus and then it comes the tendon fans out and it inserts onto the palatine bone you know from the two sides and then all the palatine muscles soft palate muscles insert onto it except for the musculus uvulus <clears throat> So the origin of the tensor villi palatine, by the way, it is called tensor because it tenses the eustachian tube, okay? The eustachian tube, it, it makes it tense. And then I'm gonna show you um, how. But the origin is uh, from the scaphoid fossa of the sphenoid bone. The big, remember the, the sphenoid bone you studied in AMP, like a butterfly bone, and it has many, many parts. So this, uh, part of the sphenoid is called the scaphoid fossa and uh, if you just simply say the sphenoid bone that is fine so it originates on the sphenoid bone and also from the lateral walls wall of the eustachian tube just like the levator villi palatina here 
see the elevator. <clears throat> so the, it is next to the elevator. So if you cut out the elevator, you can see that muscle in full, the, um, the uh, tensor villi palatini, you can see it. So it comes down and this, as it approaches the hamulus uh, of the pterygoid, uh, the, the bone, uh, that hamulus is like a little fingertip. The, the muscle just makes changes into a tendon. A tendon is tougher than a muscle and it goes below and it shows up on the other side and it inserts onto the, uh, the palatine bone the palate and bone that's part of the hard palate so you could see now from this so in effect now it goes beneath the musculus uvulus and it makes like a floor for it it gives it it gives it some support and it works with it so the, this muscle um stabilizes and flattens the velum and it 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 die in addition to stabilizing the planet, it dilates the eustachian tube. See, it, it basically it, uh, the eustachian tube is here. And when the muscle, let's take this side, when the muscle contracts, it, it pulls the, the mouth of the eustachian tube down. It's like this, like this, pulls it down. So it opens the eustachian tube okay because it tenses the, the the wall this way it tenses the wall and this opens the mouth of the station tube and that's a very important uh, thing because uh, the station to ventilates the middle ear and if there's a problem with it the person will have middle ear infections and it can cause a lot of cognitive language developmental problems and you know the palatal muscles <clears throat> now also include the palatal glossus. From the name of the palatal glossus, you have uh, uh, this is the muscle that originates on the palate and then inserts onto the margins of the tongue, the lateral margins of the tongue. So um, it, the, this palatal glossus, palate and tongue, it it it, um, it forms the anterior wall of the fascial pillars. Okay, the, these are the fascial pillars here. Here. So this, the anterior wall is formed by the palatoglossus. This is the muscle that you see. It is covered with an epithelial membrane, and but this is the muscle, left and right. Let's look here. So here, is the palatoglossus see on the margins of the um, palatal aponeurosis and um, and it comes down and it inserts onto the uh, posterior lateral margins of the tongue remember there are two of right and left so each one will do one and then what it can do is <clears throat> if you fix it the, the the connection the attachment to the to the to the palate then you can lift up the tongue if you fixate the tongue then you can bring down the velum so it has dual action uh, based on what you want to do So it either elevates the tongue or depresses the velum. Either, either lowers the velum or, or uh, lifts up the tongue, that muscle. The palatopharyngus is behind it, right directly behind it. But it spreads more. It spreads, uh, the insertion goes down to, to more than one. So the origin originates from the palatal aponeurosis and the posterior margins of the hard palate, right there, here. Um, some of the fibers uh, course uh, laterally and, and down to insert onto the pharyngeal muscles. <clears throat> and, um, and also, um, 
to form the posterior walls of the um, of the fascial pillars. So here is a fascial pillar. This is the anterior wall. This is the posterior wall. Yeah, that is the muscle palatopharyngus. But it's called pharyngus uh, palatopharyngus because it connects the 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 palate with the pharynx. The, the fibers that go down, they insert on posterior upper borders of the thyroid cartilage and they blend with the pharyngeal constrictors. The upper fibers that are here, they go over, over um, the, you know, other parts of the, of the velum, they go over and they interdigitate, they connect with each other from side to side. So the action of the palatopharyngus is to narrow the pharynx and to assist in bringing the velum down, for example. So let me say, mm, mm. So just to, you know, the space now, there's a wedge, there's a space between the palatoglossus and a space between, and, and the, and the mouth and the palatopharyngus here. So this is the palatoglossus. And behind in this area here is the palatopharyngus. That triangle in between houses the palatine tonsils, or the ones we call them the tonsils, right inside of your mouth. They are called the palatine tonsils.